Hello, so in the last capsule, we were talking about weak convergence and norm convergence. We defined weak convergence. What is weak convergence? A sequence Vn converges to V weakly means the difference Vn minus V dot product with W goes to 0 for every W. So weak convergence is really weak because you can take our favorite Hilbert space L2 of minus pi pi and the principles of the very first chapter, the Riemann Lebeg lemma tells us that sin nx converges to 0 weakly. But sin nx is far from norm convergent. It is not norm convergent. It is not pointwise convergence. So weak convergence is very weak. What we proved in the last lecture is a very important theorem. In fact, what we have proved is a very special case or the important banach alagulu theorem. What we did is norm boundedness implies there is a subsequence that converges weakly. Now you might wonder, is this some kind of a compactness argument? If you have been having these kinds of questions creeping up, that means you are on the right track. Yes, indeed, we have proved a compactness theorem actually. What is happening is that you take the Hilbert space H, infinite dimensional of course, and you take the unit ball in the Hilbert space. The closed unit ball is not going to be compact. So you simply do the following. You throw away the norm topology and replace it by a weaker topology. This weaker topology has the property that every sequence will have a convergent subsequence. So what we have shown is that the unit ball in an infinite dimensional Hilbert space is sequentially compact with respect to the weak star topology. And of course we had assumed that the Hilbert space is separable and this has been done only for Hilbert spaces. The general theorem is the banach lagulu theorem. I won't even state what the banach lagulu theorem is. You can read it in Goffman Pedrick's book, which I referred to last time. Now, how is this going to be important? It's going to be a very important ingredient in the basic step in the proof of the spectral theorem. Before we get to that, let me just make one small comment. We have seen that there is no hope of getting norm convergence out of weakly convergent sequences. Sin nx, sin nx converges to zero weakly. There is no way we are going to be getting any kind of norm convergence out of this. So norm convergence implies weak convergence. The converse is not true, but the converse will become true under additional hypothesis. There is a peculiar additional condition from which we can actually recover norm convergence out of weak convergence. And that result is remarkable and it can be used at several places and it pops up at unexpected places. So for records, I have stated it very clearly in the slide, theorem 91. Suppose H is a Hilbert space and Vn is a sequence that converges weakly to V and further assume that norm Vn converges to norm V. This condition, note, is a very special condition. Then we can conclude that Vn actually converges to V in norm. Go back to the example of sin nx. Sin nx converges to zero, but norm sin nx does not converge to norm zero, remember? So this condition is very special. It's a very important condition. We can prove this result using the parallelogram law for Hilbert spaces. We shall not do so because we will not use this theorem. Now let's get to the spectral theorem. We are now ready to prove the spectral theorem for compact self-adjoint operators on a Hilbert space. We are going to assume that the Hilbert space is separable. There's no harm in doing that. In this capsule and in the next one will be used in the proof of this important theorem. Now, a few preliminaries which we should dispose of before we get to the spectral theorem, theorem 92. Suppose T from H to H is a self-adjoint operator. Then inner product TVV is real for all V in H. Eigenvalues of T, if they exist, are real. 
we are not shown eigenvalues exist that's going to be proved later but right now we have got to put this disclaimer that eigenvalues of t if they exist are real the eigenvectors corresponding to distinct eigenvalues are perpendicular to each other the first two results are of course significant only when the hilbert space is complex if the hilbert space is real then one is a moot point but in our spectral theorem we shall produce directly a real eigen value so we really don't have to prove this result but for completeness let us give an elementary argument to prove theorem 92 even in the complex case so first of all tvv because of self adjointness the t can be put on the right hand side and once i put the t on the right hand side i switch the factors and i put a complex conjugate and it immediately implies that tvv is real now the second one suppose lambda is an eigen value of t with eigen vector v then what happens what is tvv on the one hand it's going to be lambda v the lambda comes out it's simply in a product of v with itself it is lambda norm v squared on the other hand because of self adjointness tvv i put a t on the other side now tv is lambda v but this time when the lambda comes out it comes out as a bar on top of it and there will be lambda bar times norm v squared now compare these two expressions we got and remember that v is a non zero vector so norm v squared is not going to be zero so we conclude that lambda must be equal to lambda bar and therefore lambda must be real so eigen values if they exist are real finally suppose v and w are eigen vectors corresponding to two distinct eigen values lambda and mu that means what that means that tv w which will be equal to v tw what does this translate to this translates to saying that lambda v w equal to v mu w now both mu and lambda are real so when they come out of this inner product there is no question of putting any bar on top of it so we will get that lambda minus mu times inner product v w is zero and lambda and mu are distinct so this is not zero so the only other option is that the inner product of v and w is zero and that completes the third part also so now we come to the existence of eigen values and let us recall what we did in chapter 6 in chapter 6 we did the variational characterization of eigen values right we translated the problem of the dirichlet problem for a two point boundary value problem y double prime plus lambda rho xy equal to 0 with dirichlet boundary condition into a variational problem before doing so we reexamined the situation in elementary linear algebra and we discuss the spectral theorem in that particular context so let us recall that briefly because we are going to use those ideas here in the context of hilbert spaces so take a real symmetric matrix a and you take v transpose av and that's a quadratic form you take this quadratic form you restrict it to the unit sphere norm v equal to 1 and the unit sphere in rn is compact it's finite dimensional here is where the finite dimensionality becomes crucial and the compactness of the closed unit ball in rn is crucial the supremum that you see sub in a product avv is attained at some vector v1 let us call it and this v1 is going to be the eigen vector and the supremum is going to be the eigen value how do you continue you take the orth complement of v1 and you slice the unit sphere by this ortho complement and you get a sphere of smaller dimension and you keep continuing you take the supremum on the sphere of smaller dimension and that will be the next eigen value lambda 2 and the supremum will be attained at v2 that will be the next eigen vector v2 and by construction v1 and v2 were orthogonal and so on and so forth and in finitely many steps we get a complete sequence of eigen vectors and we proved the spectral theorem that way now unfortunately we are in a infinite dimensional setting instead of a matrix we have a self adjoint compact linear transformation and the hilbert space is infinite dimensional we could start out with tvv and we could take the supremum but unfortunately we are no longer 
in the situation where the unit ball is compact. The compactness of the unit ball is not available for us. What we have is a weak substitute, namely the weakly convergent subsequence that we have. It is this weak substitute that we need to employ in order to prove the theorem. So this is the crux of the proof of the spectral theorem. Once we are through with this part, the rest of the matter is routine. And the same idea of maximizing the Rayleigh quotient, instead of taking AVV, we simply take TVV, take the supremum of that. We know that this is real and we can use the weak compactness of the unit ball, which is why the banakala Gulu theorem was so important. We have proved the banakala Gulu theorem in the Hilbert space setting. Before carrying out this project, let us make a couple of simple observations. Now suppose if TVV is zero for all V, then T must be zero. Why is that? TVV is zero means instead of V replace it by V plus W, instead of V replace it by V minus W, we get these two equations and subtract and we get TVW plus TWV equal to zero. And from this we will get that TVW equal to zero for all VW in H. And that will mean that if I take W equal to TV, we will conclude that T is identically zero. So that's how we prove the theorem. So clearly we may assume that T is not the zero operator and so the Rayleigh quotient cannot be identically zero. TVV is called the Rayleigh quotients. Replacing T by minus V, we know that TVV or minus TVV, one of them must be real number which is positive. So the Rayleigh quotient certainly assumes some strictly positive values. So the supremum of TVV will always be positive. So now we continue. So theorem 93, suppose T from H to H is a compact self-adjoint operator on a Hilbert space. Then you take the Rayleigh quotient TVV and take the supremum over the unit sphere. This supremum will be an eigenvalue and this will be attained at an eigenvector. So although the unit ball is not compact in the norm topology, the weak compactness suffices for our purpose. Call the supremum lambda and the supremum exists. And why does the supremum exist? Simply take the absolute value and apply cauchy schwarz inequality. And it's positive by the remarks made at the beginning. So take a sequence of unit vectors Vn such that Tvn Vn converges to lambda. This is called as a maximizing sequence. Since T is a compact operator, this Tvn will have a norm convergent subsequence. Here we are strongly using the fact that T is a compact operator. This is very essential. So I can work with this subsequence. I can throw away the original sequence and replace it with the subsequence if you like. And I'm going to continue calling it Vn itself. So I'm going to assume without loss of generality that Tvn itself converges to some y, let us say. Further, the Vns are norm bounded because they are unit vectors. And so they have a weakly convergent subsequence. The, version of the Banakala Gulu that we have proved for Hilbert spaces. And so they have a weakly convergent subsequence and I'm going to pass on to the subsequence and replace Vn by the subsequence. I'm going to work with the subsequence only and I'm going to rename it as Vn itself. So without loss of generality, we may assume that Vn minus V0 inner product with W goes to zero for every W. That is Vn converges to V0 weakly. So now we got Vn converging to V0 weakly, Tvn converging to Y in norm, that is very strongly. So we're going to use both these things to, uh, in our work. So now let us take the inner product of Tvn and Vn, add and subtract a Y, add and subtract a Y. The first piece goes to zero because Tvn converges to Y in norm and the second piece Vn converges to V0 weakly. So we get 7.36. So Tvn Vn converges to Y, comma V0. But Tvn Vn converges to lambda. Remember Vn was a maximizing sequence. So we get the first result which is in red saying that the inner product of Y and V0 must be lambda. Next, Tvn Vn is real. And so the limit lambda is also real. 
Now let us apply self-adjointness of T. T V N Z through the T on the Z part, we get V N T Z. But V N converges to V naught weakly. It is V naught T Z. Put the T back on the V naught, and we get V naught of Z. At the same time, because T V N converges to Y in norm, T V N Z will converge to Y Z. So again, compare the two results. We get that T V naught Z equal to Y Z in a product, and Z is arbitrary and that means that T V naught must be Y. Correct? So now we get lambda which is in a product of Y and V naught. We also get that Y is T V naught. So we get that lambda is basically T V naught V naught and so we see that the supremum is attained at V naught and because lambda is positive this V naught cannot be 0 and so certainly the supremum is attained and it is a non-zero vector. Let us prove that it is actually a unit vector. We have to show it is a unit vector. So fix an m and vn converges weakly to v0 and m is fixed. So in the product vn vm goes to v0 vm. So we see that norm v0 vm will be less than or equal to 1. Letting m tend to infinity, we get that norm v0 is less than or equal to 1. Now on the other hand, t v0 by norm v0, v0 by norm v0 is less than or equal to lambda because lambda is the supremum of all these things, t v v where v is a unit vector. Now you clear the denominators and we see that lambda which is t v0 v0 is less than or equal to lambda norm v0 squared, lambda is non-zero, it is positive. So norm v0 squared must be greater than or equal to 1. So combining the two equations we get norm v0 is equal to 1. So we have finally shown that the supremum of this Rayleigh quotient, what is the Rayleigh quotient in the product of Tv with V where V is a unit vector. That is the quadratic form Tv in a product with V restricted to the unit sphere, the supremum is attained and it attained at a unit vector V0. The most difficult part of the spectral theorem is now over. Now we have to show that this point V0 that we captured is an eigenvector corresponding to the eigenvalue lambda. This part of the argument is exactly similar to what we have done in chapter 6. It is exactly for this reason that we took this spectral theorem carefully for a matrix in chapter 6. So we did a dry run for a elementary and well-known case so that now we are ready to attack the infinite dimensional setting. So the argument is very similar, perturb V0 ever so slightly by adding a th, V0 plus th is not a unit vector, divide by the length it becomes a unit vector, clear the denominators we get that the inner product T V0 plus th v0 plus th less than or equal to lambda times norm v0 plus th squared. Expand the two sides. The right hand side will be norm v0 squared that is 1 and then we got a v0 in the product with th and then we are going to get a th in the product with v0 and then the t will be coming out and there will be a t squared term and here we got t v0 v0 and that t v0 v0 will lambda, the lambda will cancel out and, and so on. We will get the terms involving t, the 2t into t v naught h less than or equal to 2t lambda v naught h, there will be a t squared term which I have conveniently ignored because I am going to divide by mod t and I am going to allow the t to go to 0. So anyway it is going to disappear. So now when I divide by mod t and let t go to 0, through positive values and through negative values we will get two inequalities. These inequalities will combine to give an equality. T v0 minus lambda v0 in a product with h should be 0. And h was arbitrary so we conclude that T v0 will be equal to lambda v0 and we have proved that v0 is an eigenvector. In particular eigenvalues and eigenvectors exist if the operator T is a compact self-adjoint operator on a Hilbert space. So the most difficult part of the spectral theorem is now over. And we must go back to chapter 6 and read the proof of the spectral theorem for a real symmetric matrix 
and compare that proof with this proof, the stumbling block was the non-compactness of the unit ball or the unit sphere in a Hilbert space with respect to norm topology. But you don't work with the norm topology, you throw away the norm topology and you replace it by the weak topology and you invoke the banak alaglu theorem and you get around the difficulty. And this was a remarkable thing. I think this will be a very good place to stop this capsule and we'll continue this in the next capsule. We'll complete the proof of the spectral theorem. The reason why I'd like to bifurcate this into two parts is that the difficult part has been addressed here. The routine stuff which will be addressed in the next capsule. There's a very clear polarization in the proof and so this will be a very good place to stop. Thank you very much.